Intro music is provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Do you have a paranormal story you want to share on Night Dreams Talk Radio? You could be a guest. Email us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. The views, opinions, and representations expressed on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network and its website are those of the hosts, guests, and participants, and are not necessarily those of or endorsed by the network, its affiliated stations and broadcasts, the management, other hosts, or advertisers of the network. The shows found on the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network can, but do not necessarily, promote any particular lifestyle, belief, religion, political affiliation, or other personal practice. These shows are for entertainment purposes only, and are not intended to treat, diagnose, and or claim any cure of disease or condition, or give any medical or legal advice. You are Saturday, Paranormal Psychic and Ghost Hunter, on Night Dreams Talk Radio Network, James Creechbaum. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm James Creechbaum. I hope everybody's having a great Saturday. And tonight I have an awesome, great guest. His name is Patrick Cross. And without further ado, Patrick, tell us a little bit about yourself, buddy. Yes, hi, James. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been great, great promotion all week. Um, well, I'm uh, one of the early paranormal friends at Sigares, as you should say. I've been doing this for about 27 years, more than most. And I got into it really because of life experiences of growing up in a haunted house which oh, wow. was not anything that I entitled to do, but my parents bought a house that was a murder place or a murder site where there was a, a family, a, a son who killed the mother and the father and his girlfriend, uh, chopped off all the bodies, killed oh, them, and, and, and hit all the body parts around the house. Jeez. Eventually he was char- charged and uh, sent to life in prison. And he was wow. only 17 at the time. So... My father bought the house because um, he thought it was a great deal. And in those days, in the 60s, there was no disclosure of if you uh, there were murders or anything was going on. People didn't really talk about it or care. Nowadays, you have to disclose everything if there is a murder or something happening in your house. So um, I had to live with all that for about 18 to 20 years. Wow. <laughs> of all wow. the things that went on in my house and especially worse things that went on and got worse as I went as I lived there so that's really how I got into the paranormal and then it kind of started following me after I was in college and everything else let me ask you a question Patrick do you think there was something in that house that caused that 17 year old to do that or was he just you think he had mental problems or what's your take on that well he I think he had mental problems at the time. Um, there was no cure. I mean, you know, if you had mental illnesses going on in those days, right. I think they, they, they would diagnose you as crazy and lock you up. I so see, there's yeah. been a lot of stories where maybe children grown up out, out, of, out of abuse and things like that and then done certain things, especially like Lizzie Borden. If, you know, she was, she, she was brought up in a house of abuse and then she killed her parents, right? So... Um, 
I don't know the whole thing, but all I think, all I know is that he he lost it, basically killed his girlfriend because the oh. parents didn't want anybody to, uh, him to do anything with her anymore, or her to see her, or him, and he, and then he ended up killing her, and he killed, and he tried to kill himself, but he didn't have a, it was much not much success, and he pretended that he hit all the bodies, and mm. they eventually found all the body parts. But the sad part is. Uh, a lot of the body parts were still buried around the house when I was growing up. Jeez. So that there's there had to be a you had to be a lot of spirits and stuff uh, at unrest, so to speak, in that house. I would imagine. My goodness. Wow. Well, you know, not only the fact that it was on native land, and when they developed the area, they didn't care about the cemeteries, the Indian ground. They just burned bulldozers right over and built houses on the land. Oh my goodness! So, so this. Um, Wow, so that's like the movie Poltergeist and Amityville all in one in your house. Jeez. <laughs> and, and of course, in the 70s, nobody talked about any of this, and nobody knew what the heck was going on. And no. from all my experiences, I was later on a lot of experiences and a lot of things you see on TV and things crawling on the walls and things happening with blood dripping and all that stuff on the walls was all documented from... I'll let people like myself who who had all these experiences but wouldn't, couldn't talk about them because it was all shot, hushed up unless, you know, the media got a hold of it later on. Yeah, really. Uh, yeah, they believe me, they, they hushed that stuff up. I think there was a landmark case in, like, 1988 in New York about somebody bought a house that was haunted and they, they didn't like it. But every state's different. You, you, you didn't know, especially in the 70s, you know. They, they hid that stuff. So, um... Things started off okay and uh, went to worse. I guess it started off with mild ghosts, as we should say, or things walking around and touching and feeling and ghost spots and cold things. And I could hear whispers and talking and, you know, things walking around the basement and footprints. And my father, who was a devout Christian uh, Catholic, he uh, he always thought the house was settling. So he never would admit things would happen even though he'd see shadows and he'd see doors open and he goes, oh yeah, the house is settling. How does the door open? And the fully open and closed, you know, with the air, where does the air come from, right? So like things like that. It was um, pretty bizarre and it got worse because I guess as I'm young and innocent and a young kid, I go uh, attracted to you and want to connect to you at the time. But there was a combination of, I guess, later on developed into demonic activity that I grew up with. So it wasn't just the ghost that was happening. It was, no, it was just seeing black shadows and shadow things walking down the hall. And we had one of those uh, rhythmic organs that you could play, you know, that you plug, you'd plug in. And it would usually play on its own, but it was, wasn't even plugged in. Some kind of oh. funeral music. It was just bizarre stuff. <laughs> wow. That, that is bizarre. Oh, my goodness. How did you take that? How old was you when, when that started happening? I was about 14 because I was also infatuated with music and guitar. And I wanted to, you know, I was I was listening in 1969 to Led Zeppelin and all those other bands. So um, that's what kind of got me inspired because I wanted to do something different as a kid. Uh, I was pretty bullied when I was a kid. So um, I was kind of younger. I was kind of like smaller, and I wanted to, you know, rat, lash out. So I thought, hey, music was the best next thing, and, uh, well, you know, the ghost came along with it. But uh, it just got pretty bizarre because I got in, you know, I'm, I was trying to figure it out. My brother would uh, see things in his room. He had an attic, and the attic would open and close by itself at night, and he would see all kinds of things. He'd be running out screaming, and it... Uh, it was pretty hard to live with. My house, my 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 own red bedroom was always cold, freezing on the wall on the on the far wall, and no matter if it was summertime, ninety degrees, it would always cold. I'd see things moving around and hear things, and I think the worst thing was I uh, we had this closet doors, heavy wooden doors that would slide across, and I wouldn't I didn't even like going to bed anymore because I wow. I I'd, I'd close the doors and I'd see. You know, I wake up two, three in the morning, and there'd be these red eyes, about four and a half feet tall, standing just above in the middle of the doors, and the doors would open, and these red eyes staring at you. And I'd just literally freak. I'd be running everywhere. My dad would come out and go, "There's nothing there," and he'd try and beat me up and punch me. And he goes, "What's wrong with you?" And I'd, I'd do this every night. I just, I freak out. 
Yeah, yeah. no kidding. Jeez. <laughs> so that's enough to get your attention when you're looking at red eyes, at, you know, at 3, 4 in the morning. My goodness. And, huh. uh, you know, they would just stare. They wouldn't blink or anything. They would just disappear. And eventually I had to start putting rocks on my bedspread because the bed the bedspread, the covers kept being pulled off. And the rocks would act. I figured, well, this is a good way to stabilize it. Could at least the rocks would hold it down so I could sleep. But it got pretty bizarre. Uh, yeah, sounds like it. Now, um, as you got a little bit older, did you have some encounters with uh, some UFOs or aliens also? Um, well, my father worked for NASA. And originally he worked in, uh, um, he was in Los Angeles in California. And then he was in Vegas for a while. And uh, my family was uprooted about two or three times. So eventually he moved to Canada. But I could never figure out what he did for a work because he would always go to work with a briefcase and handcuffs around the briefcase on his arm. Oh, that's and not he'd, a... be up, he'd be picked up by, you know, a limo with all these guys in black glasses and uniforms and it looked like the blue and black. And he'd be just brought home that way. And I thought, hey, this is the original way to go to work. <laughs> yeah, that's not a red flag handcuffs and a limo picking you up. <laughs> and he always come back home with documents and classified. And he goes, and I asked him how it worked. He goes, oh, it's all classified. can't talk. It's eyes only. And he'd always wear these black glasses around when he'd come home. It was just really, I thought it was normal, you know. <laughs> but uh, I think that was a related to that because I don't know. I mean, he, he got into some pretty classified stuff, and he had all kinds of classified uh, blueprints and eyes only on his, on his drafting board downstairs. And uh, he'd always blame me for writing on them because I always found these weird diagrams like, uh, you know, look, look like crop circles and different crosses and different circles and weird stuff. And he'd go, what are you writing on my blueprints for? And I go, I didn't do it. Oh. <laughs> All these things were happening in the drafting room downstairs, and the doors would open and close, and things would come in. It was just, it was just, so, uh, just totally bizarre stuff. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I had to live with this for like at least, I moved out when I was 20 years old. But mm -hmm. um, it got worse because I just, I think my brother and I challenged it, and then there was demon demon activity that came through that became demonic. So no, I would always, I would that always a, see. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to ask that demon activity was that at the house where the murders were, or is this another place? No, no, the house where the murders were. So I think it escalated okay. because I would, I would always hear, um, you know, uh, screaming down the basement, like a woman screaming, and I'd hear an axe chopping away and chopping up, up and you, there was, you go downstairs and be nothing there. And then, you know, like something dragged across the floor, like a huge box. Um, my mom, I, I would go down the, to the uh, fruit cellar and you'd see uh, blood dripping from the ceiling and it would appear on the floor. My mother would wipe it up and it would come back again. It was just out of thin air. Wow. So it was just like all these things would be happening. Um, I guess the ghosts were you know, in quite despair and, you know, screaming for revenge because they were killed. Right. And um, the bodies were still buried around the house. And the reason I know they were buried around the house because we eventually dug them up. <laughs> so that's kind of how we found out they were around the house. Jeez. So, so there was a demon there in the house also. That's why I asked, do you think the demon might have caused that or was the demon attracted by all the murders? You got an opinion on that? I think the one? negativity in the murders caused it because negativity okay. causes more things. Right, And, of right. course, my family always fought, and my my mom and dad always fought, and there was a lot of stress. So there was, I think, arguments and stress built up that thing. But, you know, I'd open a cupboard door, and you'd see, like, these uh, kind of, like, drips of blood, like almost like a, 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 a rose color, sugar color drips dripping off, off, the, off the covers. Oh and I didn't goodness. realize it until I realized later on in research all that it was blood. And blood becomes glucose or sugar-coated when it yeah. becomes uh, coagulated, right? Right. So uh, the, all this stuff was coming off. He'd wipe it off and it'd come up again. And my mother always thought, well, you know, the, the covers are leaking. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> how can that happen, right? Right, so, right. Um, but between the ghost and the, the demon, the demonic, demonic stuff just, got worse. I don't know if it was because I became older or, you know, into puberty and things like that. I don't know if it was seven.